was Monday morning after all the decisions were taken to close the country because of a Category 2 hurricane approaching. Um, we had the Emergency Operations Center activated. So I was at the Emergency Operations Center um, up to about 6 o'clock and decided that I would have gone home and um, assist from home um, by providing information to the general public from my home and would alternate it, EOC my home, EOC my home. Um, but about 7 o'clock, we started lo losing connectivity between myself and the EOC. And uh, from there, everything just went downhill. Um, lots of rain, high winds, and uh, <laughs> the first thing that happened to me was my neighbor's large water tank blew away and fell in my backyard. And uh, when I saw that, I was sort of afraid that I was going to be flooded. I was in the basement of my house, the lower level of my house. And uh, then we started uh, hearing these furious winds out there. And by about 9, 10 o'clock, that's when I think we really felt the impact. I live uh, about 1,500 feet above sea level, so I'm way up. So the winds would be higher at that elevation. And um, after a while, I just started hearing all kinds of strange noises um, upstairs. Now, I thought for a while that um, my entire upper level had collapsed because of the significant noises I was hearing. Um, it went on for quite a few um, hours. And uh, one of the um, things I really did not want to happen was to have my front door compromised. But I had several bolts on my front door, one at the top, one at the bottom, and the middle locks. And what I would do when there's a lull, I would go check, make sure the door is still um, in place and well intact, and then run back when I hear the winds pick up again, run back. Because I didn't want to be, be holding a door down trying to um, stop the, <laughs> the door from, because I could have um, injured myself also yeah, in, in, in trying to do that. So I'll go back to my little position, which was in the corridor, in a narrow corridor. And then after a while, I started feeling the walls of the lower level um, shaking, and I could feel some sort of trembling effect on the, on the floor, which means the even the foundation was moving. And at that time, I, I got real scared because I thought the house was going to collapse on me. Um, anyway, that didn't happen. I uh, stayed, stayed around and weathered the storm. And um, when everything, when there was really a, a, a continuous lull, I decided at least I would go lay down for a while and um, hoping that day would break sooner than it actually broke. Um, but also, one of the things I had to be doing was um, to mop water because um, water was coming from all directions. Um, under the doors, um, at one point, when I looked at my curtains, all my curtains were dripping, they were wet. I'm not sure where the water came from, but all the curtains were wet. And there was a constant drip onto the floor, so I had to ensure that um, the floor um, was, was dried. Um, slept through, and at about 3 or 3.30, thereabouts, in the early morning, I started seeing lights on the outside, which means people were out, and, but at one time, I thought I was the only person alive, eh? because I, did not, I, wa I wasn't hearing any screams, I wasn't hearing anybody talking or anything like that. So I thought I was the only person alive, based on what I, I, I had been hearing. But when these people came out of the lights, I realized people were sort of surveying what had happened. So there were a few people alive. And then two guys were passing with a conversation, and one said, but nothing happened to this house, referring to my house. And the other one replied, well, it's the disaster, it's the disaster man that stay in there, so he know how to build his house. So I felt a little better because then I realized my upper level had not um, caved in. Because even in bed, I had already taken a decision. I wasn't going to rebuild it. All I would do is just remove the debris and put a, a roof over the concrete floor. Um, for further protection of the basement and just agree that I was only going to have a basement. Um, when I got up in the morning, um, early, light, 4.30, pip, 
outside, to my cl closest neighbor, I saw the entire roof was gone. Several windows um, disappeared, actually dislodged from the, from the frame. Um, I then looked further, and uh, when I saw what had happened close around me, I still wasn't sure what happened to me, but close around me, I figured it was a na national disaster. Um, I, I carry a, a satellite phone, so it was raining very heavily the next, that, that early morning. So I went out in my garage and dialed um, one of my um, colleagues who was in Antigua. And because of the rain, I had to step out of the garage, say something, go back to the garage. And, you know, with satellite technology, you have to be in an exposed area. So I would lose the call and I would dial again. But I was able to get enough out to the person so that he had a sense of what had happened and he was able um, to call the U.S. Embassy in Barbados and give them a report um, and that is from our USAID um, standpoint. And when it was um, safe enough, I, I went out and sort of explored the community and the community was just devastated. I think maybe um, out of maybe the 250, 300 homes or houses in that area, I think there were only maybe about six that were um, sort of um, not really untouched, but livable. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I started looking at my own situation, and then I realized all the noises I had been hearing in the night was um, debris from my neighboring, my neighbor's houses. Actually, the neighbor to the north of me, the entire roof went up and fell on my house. So that is the big noise I heard when I thought there was a punch, uh, 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 sort of explosion or what, what, whatever. And then I realized that um, I was getting water ingress from that into the upper level. We looked around, um, maybe about 10 or 12 windows of my upper level had um, blown in um, again because of flying debris, two by fours, two by threes, two by sixes. Um, the, my backyard had enough material I could build, a, build another house <laughs> because everybody's thing fell right in, into my backyard. Um, it was a little too dicey for me to attempt to leave where I was to come down to town. So I um, did not move because the rains were still heavy. But first light the next morning, I walked down from my home to to downtown um, to help to establish an EOC and to meet with NEPO and what have the National Emergency Planning Organization. A walk which would normally take me 45 minutes took me almost four hours because we had to be climbing over landslides, we had to go down in the valley, we had to cross several passages of, of rivers because all the bridges between my home and downtown were sort of compromised and so on. Um, so it, it, it was a rough walk. As a matter of fact, um, I was feeling so badly when I got into town, I asked them to put a, 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 an ambulance and the doctor on standby just in case I needed some attention. And um, later when the doctor examined me, he, he found that my blood pressure had dropped. Um, and I think it was because of the long walk and the excessive sweating, I had lost a lot of salt. Um, we established um, an EOC immediately, uh, but again, limited because um, everybody, well, every, everybody seemed to have been traumatized. People didn't report for work, obviously, and um, we had a major access problem, a major communications problem, and within a few hours later, we had a, a major security problem. So... Pretty much that's the story about Maria. Yeah. Um, cool. um, so you're touching on, on the, you know, at least trying to establish the EOC. So go a little bit more into the response phase. Yeah, so the response had to start immediately. But again, as I indicated, a lot of government functionaries were not available. Um, the prime minister was um, available. He had walked from his, he, he, his roof, part of his roof also went where he lives. Um, however, he walked from his area to downtown, which is another lengthy walk, but he was able to go to the cabinet room, go to his office. His office was also compromised. 
um, but the cabinet room was intact, and a few other ministers assembled there. And uh, for the early days, I think we only had about half a dozen of the ministers and one or two of the permanent secretaries. Most of them were caught in their area because nobody could move um, to, to anywhere. However, we were able to start the ball rolling um, with whatever we had and start doing some kind of assessment of, of what had happened. The RSS plane, I, I guess, was made available through CDMA to do an aerial reconnaissance, and um, they did indicate to us the extent of the damage, and the Prime Minister also did a, a reconnaissance himself by air and indicated that what he had seen, um, we were almost pretty much wiped out. I think the early warning systems worked well to a point, like everything else. Uh, we were able to get information, we were able to disseminate information, um, but uh, from the time, 7, 8 o'clock that night, once we lost connectivity, I, I, that was just it. Um, I think we lost some um, sections of um, some of the early warning systems, some, some of them remained intact. Um, what we have to do um, going forward is to ensure that they are a little more robust um, but it's easier said than done. Uh, how do you make um, something robust? Um, put, putting it out there, exposed, because it has to be exposed. It has to be exposed so you get the, the, the rain um, information. It has to be exposed so you get the water levels from the rivers and the streams and the ravines, wherever they, they're installed. So it's, it's sort of difficult to, to make it robust or even more robust. But again, we have to look at it and do whatever um, we can do to ensure survivability um, because it, it plays a critical role in um, really alerting people. The, the, the main problem we had with uh, Maria is uh, the fact that it gained in strength um, from a Category 2 to a Category 5 in quick time, which has never happened in that quick time. Um, so it's, it's pretty much a record. Uh, it's also the biggest storm that has ever hit um, a Caribbean country um, for all our lives put together. Um, so there's, there's not too much um, we can do. Um, we would have hoped that, um, because even some of the early warning um, system depends on our service providers for internet and what have you. And if these things go, then there's, there's not much you can do. Um, I know from our standpoint, we're trying to get a, a fiber, um, fiber service into, into here. Um, Digicel is uh, continuing its um, operations outside, uh, just outside the office, uh, to uh, uh, trying to make it a little more robust, uh, they are and they are going to try to hook us directly onto their system here instead of us trying to get it from further afield, which makes it um, more workable. Um, so we hope that the next time, I think one of the things maybe I will, I will recommend that we invest in is a satellite internet system. Although we have the satellite phones, but um, they again, they have their limitation. But if we can get a, a, a satellite dish, that can provide the internet. We know we'd have to put it down and then put it up quickly. And we have no issues about putting things down and put it back up. It's, it's how quickly you can put it back. And one of the things we are saying to our service providers is, look, you went through that experience. We know you may not be able to put a robust tower that will withstand 200 miles an hour, but have a tower in a secured place. So immediately after, within a couple of days, you can have that up and run. And same with other equipment that could be damaged, especially antennas that would be on the tower. Um, the radio stations, because that was one of our biggest challenges. People cannot hear anything about what is going on. People do not know what we are doing or what the government is doing. People do not know what, the, what is happening in the village right next to them. Um, even with overseas, people who have um, relatives and friends overseas, they, they, they really do not know what is going on. So it, it puts people in a sort of a, a situation where, almost hopeless situation, you know. In my early days in disaster management, government owned a lot of heavy equipment. And what we used to do at that time is strategically position them 
pretty much in the four corners of the, of the country. So if something like that happens, they would start working immediately and work their way into town. I don't think we had um, enough heavy equipment strategically located because most of them are now owned by um, individuals. So you are at the mercy of them wherever they are. So it took us a little while to, to get even downtown cleaned up. Um, but when we started going, we really started going quickly. So that's one, I think, in terms of, um, because of Dominica's topography, you cannot drive five miles. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not even sure why am I saying five miles. You cannot drive um, a mile without crossing a, a ravine or a river or something. So you have all these need for bridges. I think we should keep a few um, Bailey bridges in stock because that was one of our biggest requirements so that for mobility. Um, up to now, we are putting up Bailey bridges. So um, that, that, that is, is, is a key issue. The whole security issue is something, um, I mean, uh, a lot of the technical things I'll defer to the security services, but one of the things that I think we have to put in place immediately, and we did make that recommendation, that there be that the um, emergency powers act to be invoked even before the storm, and that would give the security forces some sort of a, um, not necessarily a leeway, but would assist them in performing their duties because it would sort of keep with a curfew that is, so it would keep people at bay a little, so that um, we could. Uh, of um, patrols and what have you. But one of the things um, from the private sector standpoint we would maybe want to see is the private sector take ownership of their own security, do not depend on the state fully. Yes, the state has its responsibility to secure them, but not fully. So they should do like um, people do in Miami. When a storm is approaching Miami City, everybody goes out to Home Depot and pick up 10, 15, 20 sheets of plywood and start boarding up their place. So it makes it a little more difficult to penetrate. Uh, maybe they should be investing now in some of these heavy-duty roll-down shutters and things like that. Because we had one or two businesses which had those things and they were not penetrated. Um, and um, the other thing is people must listen and not always go into a state of complacency. And that is our biggest challenge. I mean, we were virtually begging people to go home and get away from rivers, get away from ravines, because we had just had the experience of Tropical Storm Erica. And uh, driving from here to my home, I mean, it was just amazing to see the numbers of people who were just outside and um, under the, the, the verandas and, and that we're begging them to go home. So, but I know whenever you have, not that I want to see them happen often, but whenever you have a lull, a long period of no activity, then people fall into a state of complacency. So we know that um, I think this year uh, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't even have to see hurricane. From the time we say hurry, they will certainly hurry and do something. From the government standpoint, a lot has been done. All the subcommittees have met several times more than they have ever met before. Uh, we have so far, that's, I think that's the first time so early in the hurricane season we have had the entire National Emergency Planning Organization, NEPO, meeting twice. And the Prime Minister was very, very forceful on uh, the, these subcommittees meeting and doing the work they're required to do. Um, he stressed the point that is, that is not an after job work. It's something that is part of your work and you have to do it. Um, he wasn't pleased with the first set of reporting and he said, we're going to have a meeting in a week's time. Everybody go back to the drawing board and this is what we want. Not to give us a history about what happened in Maria. Tell us what, you, what you're doing now and uh, what you need the cabinet to do, what you need the government to do for you. If there's a um, financial implication, a budgetary um, implication, let us know so we can find the monies to do what we're doing. So we're well on our way with that. In terms of a telecommunication system, since last year, um, the ODM had already decided that it was going to put a, a system in place. 
Um, but again, because of Maria, it sort of derailed it a little, but for this hurricane season, um, there will be a system in place that um, can immediately be in contact with, um, say, like CDMA and other agencies around the Caribbean, the other disaster management offices that are so equipped. Um, one of the things that was very scarce for <laughs> Hurricane Maria were satellite phones, and we are investing in quite um, some satellite phones um, at the government level. So um, we've had already um, the first week of the month, well, the last few days into the first few days of this month, Hurricane Preparedness Week. And uh, Mr. Pascal, who is the NDC, and myself, we were on the radio. About two days ago, we were on another radio station, and this time we brought in the security forces to talk about what they're going to do, their state of readiness. We brought in the shelter committee chairman to talk about shelters. We have some concern, concerns with shelters because a lot of our shelters were compromised, and we have not had the time to, to repair them. And, and it's still a work in progress. We're hoping that... Uh, we have maybe two months or so before we really start seeing activities. So within that period that we can um, do some work on some of the shelters. Uh, we have 19 communities right now without shelters. And what we're trying to do is ensure that at least each community has one shelter. We've already started publicizing for the communities that already that have shelters. We have already started publicizing um, that information. Um, tonight I go on the radio with the police on their program again to talk about preparedness. So we'll be on the airwaves um, very regularly.